Clause 2, Amendment 13, Lord Hunt of King's Heath. My Lords, I'm delighted to move my amendment, which I will be moving formally uh, at the end of the debate. And this follows constructive and very helpful discussions with the government. I'm particularly grateful to Lord Bethel, Baroness Penn, Lord Ahmed, and their officials for their help. And to my fellow sponsors, Baroness Finlay, Baroness Northover, Lord Ribeiro, and indeed Lord Alton, for the huge support they've given. I should also mention the enormous help that I've had from Victoria Ledridge of the End Transplant Abuse Campaign. My Lords, the world is increasingly aware of China's forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience. This horrific crime of forcibly removing the organs from living victims, the process leading to inevitable murder, has recently been found by the China, China Tribunal to be happening extensively. Millions of Chinese citizens are currently detained in labor camps. UN experts estimate at least one million Uyghurs being held in camps in the region of Xinjiang. Elsewhere throughout China, other ethnic and religious minorities are also being held in labor camps, such as Tibetan Buddhists, Falun Gong practitioners, and Christians. My Lords, this modern day slavery has been entering the UK supply chain. There's no doubt we are currently complicit. I must say, I welcome the statement today by the Foreign Secretary. Last year, the China Tribunal concluded that forced organ harvesting has been committed for years throughout China on a significant scale, and that the Falun Gong practitioners have been one and probably the main source of organ supply. And that in regard to the Uyghurs, the tribunal had evidence of medical testing on a scale that could allow them, amongst other uses, to become an organ bank. My Lords, I do hope the government will seek to put pressure on the World Health Organization to take this seriously. Domestically, the bill provides an opportunity to prevent British complicity in such crimes and to send an important message to other countries. My amendment is designed to deal with gaps in current UK human tissue legislation. Currently, the Human Tissue Act does not require appropriate consent for imported human tissue. In addition, imported human tissue for use in medical research doesn't require traceability. And currently, neither the Human Tissue Quality and Safety for Human Application Regulations nor the Human Tissue Act require appropriate consent for imported human tissues for use in medicines. My amendment gives powers to ministers to put this right. I should explain that the word tissue and cells is terminology which encompasses all the human material that's used for the purposes of medicines. This includes organs. My Lords, the amendment would not include the prohibition of the dreadful traveling circus of real bodies exhibitions, nor would it include medical equipment manufactured and exported from the UK for the purpose of extracting or preserving human organs to be exported to China. My noble, the noble friend, Lord Alton, will come back to that point, and I know he's had some very helpful discussions with Baroness Penn. Nonetheless, my Lords, the passing of my amendment would be a significant action. By giving ministers the power to make regulations, this is a specific act by the UK in relation to the abhorrent practices in China that I've spoken of. Of course, my Lords, we need to see those regulations introduced and passed through Parliament. But internationally, the UK's action would be seen as a marker and a real signal to other countries. My Lords, I beg to move. Amendment proposed, page 2, line 32. At the end, insert the words printed on the Marshall list. And I'll call the next speaker, Baroness Finlay of Lansdowne. This amendment is an example of how with high moral... I'll start again, my lords, because the I wasn't unmuted at the beginning. My lords, it's a great pleasure to follow the noble lord, Lord Hunter Kings Heath, on this very important amendment. This amendment is an example of how, with high moral standards, the ministers involved have been listening. With others, I wish to sincerely thank the noble lord, Lord Bethel, the noble lady, Baroness Penn, and the noble lord, Lord Armand of Wimbledon, who've listened to very difficult information 
and accepted the important responsibility we have on the world stage. Many of us have been concerned for some time about forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience. This amendment is a strong signal that the UK does not turn a blind eye, however uncomfortable facing the problem may be. Of course, there are other aspects beyond scope of the bill that we cannot ignore. First, this amendment covers only medicines. I have an ongoing concern that medical instruments or machines could be developed by experimenting on prisoners through practice operations or procedures. We must never forget the history of Dr. Mengele and his colleagues who claim scientific pursuit inflicting fatal torture on innocent people interned in concentration camps. So can the government confirm they will be increasingly vigilant over how products imported have been developed and manufactured and make sure we don't export anything that can continue some of the atrocities that we've heard of? Second, there's a gap in the HTA regulations over proof of consent over imported tissues Will the government address the gap in the regulations and ensure newly obtained tissues can't be imported without proper consent to donate the tissues? And lastly, will the government undertake to continue to support efforts to tackle transplant tourism as we know that sadly some people have misguidedly gone to China for organ transplantation? Tackling this requires a concerted effort, including to raise donor rates in other countries as well as here, to decrease the demand that fuels killing for organs. But change takes time. Today, we welcome wholeheartedly what the government has done and the very important signals that are now being sent to the rest of the world. And like other noble lords, I thank all those involved most sincerely. Now call the next speaker, Baroness Northover. My lords, Praise will be ringing in Minister's ears from the first group on Baroness Cumberledge's uh, Patients Commissioner, and praise again for listening on this one. The noble lady Baroness Penn had the task in the first instance of rebutting the original amendment, and I for one asked her to read the China Tribunal report to get a strong sense of the horrendous problem that was part of the context for this amendment. You could see that she was listening and subsequent engagement has been very useful as uh, noble lady Baroness Finlay and, Lord, and the noble Lord, Lord Hunt have said. I'm very glad that the ministerial team has responded and it does come on a day when the foreign secretary has made a statement in the commons which focuses on human violations against the Uyghurs. And I also pay tribute to the noble Lord, Lord Hunt for consistently and with great political skill taking forward this issue, as he has done on the scandal of the bodies exhibitions. I also pay tribute to the others, others who've worked in this area, including the noble lady Baroness Finley, the noble lord, Lord Ribeiro, and the noble lord, Lord Alton. This is a terrible problem and it would be easy to turn away, but these noble lords here simply do not. We do need to make further progress across this area, and I'm sure this will be taken forward. Forced organ harvesting, which according to the China Tribunal has happened on a mass scale in China, is a horrific crime. Organs are removed from living victims by doctors in state-run hospitals for transplantation, inevitably killing the victim in the process. As Lord Hunt said, the China Tribunal concluded that many victims were Falun Gong practitioners. A brutal and systematic crackdown on Falun Gong was initiated in 1999 with the, leader, with the Chinese leadership ordering their eradication. Many disappeared without a trace, which was when China's organ transplant trade rapidly increased. As we now recognize, in recent years there's been a similar crackdown on the ethnic minority Uyghurs. They've been put into re-education camps and endured forced labor, brainwashing, rape, and torture. The China Tribunal stated, and I quote, 
In regard to the Uyghurs, the tribunal had evidence of medical testing on a scale which could allow them, amongst other uses, to become an organ bank. Our amendment aims to ensure that no human tissue or cells that have been sourced from victims of organ harvesting can be used in human medicines or enter the UK medical supply chain. This will be the first time that the United Kingdom government will be enacting legislation in this area, and we must hope that it sends a strong and clear message internationally. Thus far, as the noble Lord Lord Hunt said, it's enabling, but the government will know that many will be monitoring this area. We do need to see those regulations in place. I note the weakness of the HTA assessment of the bodies exhibitions, on which I'm sure the noble Lord Lord Alton will expand and their acceptance of what they were told seemingly at face value. Baroness Finlay also rightly pointed to this. The amendment we are agreeing today will help move things forward, and I am grateful to the government and their lawyers for working on this, though clearly we will all need to be vigilant and there is still much to do. Next speaker, Lord Ribeiro. My Lords, like noble Lords who have spoken before me, I thank the Minister and Government for accepting our amendment. I believe it sends a powerful message not only to China, but to other countries like Pakistan and India, to whom I referred in my speech on the 28th of October in committee. In discussion with the Foreign Office through Lord Ahmad, we were reassured that the diplomatic strategy would be to continue lobbying as many countries as possible on the issue of human rights in relation to the immoral practice of forced organ harvesting. With Baroness Finlay, we undertook to raise awareness with the British Medical Association and the Surgical Royal Colleges. It is worth noting the World Health Organization's guiding principles on human cells, tissue, and organ transplantation. Any program like the Kidney Pairing Exchange which makes it possible to utilize kidneys which are biologically incompatible between patients and their genetically or emotional related donors must follow and respect the WHO's guiding principles of practice, particularly principles three and five. And I think they're worth quoting. Principle three, live donations are acceptable when the donor's informed and voluntary consent is obtained when professional care of donors is ensured and follow-up is well organized, and when selection criteria of donors are scrupulously applied and monitored. Live donors should be informed of the probable risks, benefits and consequences of donation in a complete and understandable fashion. They should be legally competent and capable of weighing the information and they should be acting willingly, free of any undue influence or coercion. And principle five states, cells, tissues and organs should only be donated freely without any monetary payment or other reward of monetary value. Purchasing or offering to purchase cells, tissues or organs for transplantation or their sale by living persons or by the next of kin for deceased persons should be banned. In 2017, the World Health Assembly supported a concept of financial neutrality to protect vulnerable people from being exploited. That, my laws, is the essence of what this amendment achieves, and I'm grateful to the government and Lord Patel, Lord Bethel, sorry, and Baroness Penn for endorsing it, and I hope that they will maintain their pressure on the WHO to end these practices. And I'll call the next speaker, Lord Alton of Liverpool. Yes, my Lords, I want to start, if I may, as others have done, by thanking the noble Baroness uh, Lady Penn and the noble Lord Lord Bethel uh, for the way in which they have engaged uh, with noble Lords, such as the noble Lord Lord Hunt, who has put so much work into this, uh, along with Baroness Finlay, Baroness Northover and Lord Ribeiro, in trying to draw our attention to the enormities and depredations that have occurred in China through forced organ harvesting. 
And I think it's very productive that the government have been able to come forward this, with, this evening with an amendment that's been agreed with the sponsors of the committee amendment, having listened to the arguments. And I'm grateful, as others have been, to Lady Penn especially for the way in which she has engaged. I want to come back, if I may, in a few moments to two other issues that I have raised with her, and which are not included within the amendment this evening. Uh, and they deal with the issues of consent uh, and the issue of uh, equipment that could be used in the uh, extraction, freezing, harvesting of uh, organs uh, in China, and whether if British companies were involved in the production of such equipment, there's anything we can do to forestall that. On the issue of consent, my lords, Lady Northover has mentioned that we have seen now, thanks to Lady Penn, the uh, reports of the Human Tissue Authority from 2018, when they went to the uh, National Exhibition Centre in Birmingham to examine the uh, plastinated bodies that had been taken there. These are cadavers, corpses, uh, which had been put on public display, what uh, the noble Lord Lord Hunt referred to as part of a sort of travelling circus. And there was a second exhibition held uh, later in the year. And it, I think it was extraordinarily naive to put it at its best. Um, that no more probing was done about the origins of those bodies or how consent could possibly have been given from unknown anonymized sources. Of course, leaving the question hanging in the air that these were probably people who had been executed. And sadly, we know that that is the fate of so many people, whether they're Falun Gong practitioners, people from different uh, denominational minorities, faith communities, of Uyghurs. We've heard so much already this evening, but also in the House of Commons this afternoon, the statement of the Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab about the plight of a million incarcerated people incarcerated because they will not conform to the diktats of the Chinese Communist Party. It is extraordinary that such things can happen in the 21st century, but they are happening. And it's why we have to be vigilant, and why we have to do what we can to prevent uh, the exploitation of people who are caught up in these circumstances. I think particularly this evening of a young woman called Zhen Zhang, who was arrested as a citizen journalist. She's a lawyer by background and had gone to Wuhan to investigate the origins of coronavirus. She has been languishing in a jail ever since, some of that time on a hunger strike. We know that many dissidents, people who have spoken out against the regime, including lawyers have been arrested, some have disappeared, never to be seen again. So it is crucially important that we discover the origins of bodies that are ever used in these sorts of exhibitions and displays, which personally I believe should be prohibited in their entirety. But the idea that these bodies can be paraded around for macabre purposes I, just feels, should fill people with a sense of disgust. The um, anonymity of the cadavers should have made the Human Tissue Authority see that, it, that, that this was not a, an issue which they should have just turned a blind eye to. And it's not good enough to simply say, we have a strong uh, regulatory authority. We do, we have strong regulations. We, they, many of them came out of the scandal at Alder Hay in Liverpool. Uh, but since then, what we have failed to do is plug the loophole that I and others identified in 2018, a uh, phrase that we used, a loophole, in writing a letter to the Times newspaper, uh, but it also appeared in, in The Lancet in an article there that there was a loophole that needed to be filled when it came to organs, tissues from uh, outside of the United Kingdom. And I think that this amendment tonight goes some way to addressing that, but I think there needs to be further regulation as well on this issue of consent. And I also feel, and I'd like to press the noble Baroness on this, that we must do more about the uh, export of equipment from the United Kingdom that could be used uh, in forced organ harvesting. And maybe this could be done by export license control. I noticed that in the statement this afternoon to the House of Commons and the letter that has been circulated to peers this evening by the Right Honourable Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary, on the last page he talks about there being a review of export controls as they apply to the situation in Xinjiang. And he says, these measures are among the most stringent being implemented globally to help ensure supply chains are free from forced labor. That is welcome, my lords. But how ironic it would be if in stopping things coming into this country that have been used 
manufactured by slave labor in Xinjiang. We were permitting the export of things to uh, Xinjiang and elsewhere in China that was being used in the extraction, freezing, transportation of body parts in order to uh, enable China to promote one of the biggest uh, organ industries in the world. And I think the Nobel Baroness Lady Finley was right to say to us that we need to do far more as well about uh, the phenomenon of people traveling to other parts of the world in order to take organs from others. Um, and I think that kind of organ tourism is something that the, the British government does need to do more about. So my lords, that's all I, I want to say about this. I look forward to hearing the reply from Lady Penn. Baroness Jolly. My lords, this has been a detailed, depressing debate. And I feel completely powerless. I pay tribute to Lord Hunt of Kings Heath for his phenomenal tenacity of this issue and Lord Alton for his tireless work. And I'm sure others do just as much and I don't know about it. Amendment 13, led by Lord Hunt and signed by my noble friend Baroness Northover and the Minister, would enable regulations under Clause 1.1 to make provision about the use of human tissues or cells in relation to human medicines. The amendment pushes the government to respond to the horrifying practice of forced organ harvesting, which evidence suggests is taking place in China. Baroness Finney of Landaff's account of organ banks was chilling. Liberal Democrats, among others, have been vocal about the appalling human rights violation faced by the Uyghurs. The amendment would be an important step in the right direction, and we urge the government to do all it can to put an end to this practice. And I must say, it is most unusual for a minister on a bill to be included as a signatory to an amendment. It should send a real signal, signal that our government does not support this appalling treatment of minorities, and I commend him for this stance. And in summing up, I wonder if the, I would I would be grateful if the minister could tell us there is anything that we could practically do on this matter. I'll call the next speaker, Lord Collins of Highbury. My Lords, I too uh, would like to thank all the noble Lords uh, who put their names uh, to this amendment. It uh, truly reflects the cross-party concern uh, on this issue. Um, and uh, certainly I too would like to pay particular uh, thanks to my noble friend Lord Hunt uh, and to the noble Lord, Lord Orton, who've been absolutely persistent in raising this issue at every level and we have been uh, debating this not only in terms of this bill but in other debates uh, in this house and I too would like to thank the noble lord the minister uh, and particularly the noble baroness baroness Penn for the regular meetings that she's been having with lords to listen uh, to our concern and the fact that both of them have listened and acted, I think is a reflection of the good work that this House can do in terms of not acting in a partisan way. Uh, we've actually put the issue first and delivered on it. And I'm also grateful to the noble lady for the way that she has gone to the limit in terms of the scope of this bill. And I recognize uh, that the scope of this bill has placed limitations on us, but it doesn't stop us saying and delivering on the political issue that my noble friend and the noble Lord, Lord Orton, uh, have, have raised. So I'm, I'm particularly pleased uh, to, to thank everyone concerned. But I do want to pick up a couple of points and of course one of the big political issues that started uh, my, my noble friend's concern was the exhibitions that we uh, saw and the idea uh, that you know um, consent could be given from dead or dying prisoners in China is just absolutely uh, ridiculous and uh, we should never accept it and we should continue to ensure uh, that we strengthen regulation in that regard. It will be ongoing work. 
I also want to pick up uh, the point that both my noble friend, uh, Lord Hunt, raised and the noble Lord, Lord Alton, about the issue we raised at committee. Uh, in fact, we, we raised it at uh, the second reading. Uh, the fact that there are, and we actually na named two companies that were involved in supplying organ uh, preserving devices to mainland China. Uh, which could explain how organs are being transported around China, a sort of participating and supporting in this harvesting, uh, this obnoxious uh, practice of harvesting organs. Um, and I was pleased to, to read the statement made by Dominic Raab in his announcement uh, that the government will conduct uh, an urgent review of export controls as they apply specifically uh, to the situation in the Xinjiang uh, province. And as he said, to make sure that we are doing everything we can to prevent uh, uh, export of any goods that could directly or indirectly contribute to human rights violations in that region. Well, we've heard in our debates in this House on this issue that that is potentially going on. And I hope the noble lady, the minister, will be able to respond that she will work with both the FCDO and the International Trade Department to ensure that the concerns that are being raised today uh, will be reflected in the review uh, that Dominic Raab uh, has promised. So I think, I hope uh, she will take that up. And of course, as the noble lady Baroness Northover raised, and my noble friend uh, Lord Hunter raised, in terms of the China Tribunal uh, conclusions uh, about the nature of this practice that has been going on and, and the fact that the Uyghurs and the Falun Gong practitioners are the main uh, victims of it. And of course, as we've said in many debates, uh, the the Communist Party of China and the uh, government of the People's Republic have denied all claims about this, despite the evidence uh, of the tribunal. And they have relied on the WHO uh, clearing them of wrongdoing. And of course, we know that that is because the WHO doesn't have an independent expert compliance assessment mechanism. It relies on the government of China and the Chinese Communist Party simply saying it doesn't happen. And I know the noble Lord, Lord Ahmed, has been also quite consistent and persistent in raising this issue. And I know the matter has been raised with the WHO, but I hope the noble lady, the minister, will be able to respond today that we will continue uh, to raise this issue uh, through the organ of the WHO. And in conclusion, I just want to repeat what has been said uh, by all noble lords, that the importance of this amendment is not simply in terms of the specific points of law that it will address. The most important thing this amendment does, and the debate tonight, is to send a very clear message that we won't tolerate such appalling acts against humanity and we will actually deliver for the people of China and not for the Communist Party of China. The Minister Baroness Penn. My Lords, I'd like to begin by thanking all noble lords for their valuable and ongoing engagement on the matters raised by Amendment 13. Throughout this bill's passage, we have heard numerous passionate and heartfelt speeches on the allegations of organ harvesting in China and how the UK seeks to guard against complicity in any such practices. Anyone listening to uh, speeches made by noble lords during Grand Committee or in this debate cannot fail to have understood the considerable strength of feeling behind those concerns. My noble friend Lord Bethel and I have greatly welcomed the thoughtful and constructive discussions on these issues. Earlier today, the Foreign Secretary made an announcement setting out an ambitious 
package of measures that will help to ensure that no British organisations, whether public or private, are contributing inadvertently to human rights violations in Xinjiang. This demonstrates that we will not stand by as violations there continue, and we will never hesitate to stand up for human rights as a force for good in the world. The government position is clear. If true, the practice of systemic state-sponsored organ harvesting would constitute a serious violation of human rights. The China Tribunal report has been carefully considered by the FCDO, adding to a growing body of evidence about the disturbing situation that Falun Gong practitioners, Uyghurs and other minorities are facing in China. Given the considerable interest in these and related concerns over human rights violations in China, my noble friend, Lord Ahmed, Minister for South Asia and the Commonwealth, has met repeatedly with a number of lords with particular interest in these matters over recent months. I trust that these discussions have provided some assurance of the government's absolute commitment to strong UK action. The minister is, I know, committed to ongoing engagement in coming weeks. During Grand Committee, the Noble Lords Lord Hunt and Lord Alton made clear their view that the WHO should be further engaged to take more robust action and to provide greater transparency on organ transplant practices in China. I'm pleased to tell Noble Lords that continued efforts by FCDO ministers to engage the WHO on these matters have led to a valuable meeting between senior officials at the UK mission in Geneva and Jane Ellison, Executive Director for External Relations at the WHO. These discussions have opened up dialogue with key international partners on organ harvesting allegations, which we are committed to continuing. Crucially, noble lords may know that my noble friend Lord Ahmed has committed to meeting with Sir Geoffrey Nice QC in the coming months to further discuss the findings of his report. The FCDO are, I know, absolutely committed to carefully considering all and any evidence presented on allegations of organ harvesting in China. I would also like to take the opportunity on behalf of the Minister for South Asia and the Commonwealth to thank my noble friend Lord Ribeiro and the noble lady Baroness Northover for their role in engaging international medical organisations on these matters. I will now turn to the specifics of the amendment tabled in the name of the noble Lord Lord Hunt, which I am pleased that my noble friend Lord Bethel has put his name to. The amendment provides absolute clarity that the powers at Clause 2 of the Bill can be used to make regulatory changes about the use of human tissues or cells in legislation relating to human medicines. Whilst it is important to be absolutely clear that the use of imported tissue in any medicines on the UK market is extremely limited, there is in fact only one licensed medicinal product in the UK that uses donor-derived tissues, and that tissue is sourced from within the EU, we are all in agreement that we would not want to see the UK medicines industry compromised by the use of human tissue or cells sourced through human rights violations. This amendment will ensure that we have the power to take action to amend or supplement provisions governing the use of human tissues in medicinal products in the Human Medicines Regulations 2012 or Medicines for Human Use Clinical Trial Regulations 2004 to help assure the integrity of tissues and cells used in UK medicines if necessary. The drafting and iteration of the wording of a similar amendment tabled by the Noble Lord Lord Hunt during Grand Committee delivers important clarity on a number of points. In particular, the specific reference to both tissues and cells provides certainty on the scope of materials captured and the reference to definitions of those meanings, of the meaning of those terms under the Human Tissues Quality and Safety for Human Application Regulations 2007 ensures consistency with wider UK legislation. I am also assured that this drafting allows for provisions to encapsulate the full stream of activities in the regulation of medicines that could relate to the use of tissues and cells. And, of course, as with any such provisions brought forward under Clause 1 of the Bill, this would be informed by public consultation, a critical step in ensuring that the full consideration of an appropriate approach and mitigating against any unintended consequences for existence for the supply or development of medicines in the UK. Finally, I recognise that Noble Lords have raised a number of other important related questions on how we safeguard domestic practices from being at risk of compromise by human rights violations overseas. 
In these discussions, we have sought to be completely clear with noble lords on the limitations of what can be done under this bill. However, let me reassure noble lords that concerns have not gone unheard. First and foremost, on the issue of consent standards applied to tissues imported for the purposes of public display, I'm pleased to announce that we will be taking forward work to strengthen the Human Tissue Authority's code of practice on public display for imported tissues. Although such imports are rare, we are committed to ensuring that when tissues are imported from outside the UK for the purposes of display, the consent standards applied are clear, firm and enforceable. By strengthening key safeguards, we can make sure that robust assurances on consent are fully received, considered, assessed and recorded before any display licences are issued to importers or exhibitors. We will also look at how the Human Tissue Authority's underpinning licensing processes can be used to strengthen compliance with standards. And we will also be proactive and robust in communicating best practice to establishments and importers, for instance, by issuing clear, detailed guidance on consent requirements to any establishments considering undertaking public display. My Lords, this work is underway, and I am confident that, as a result, we can work to make sure no exhibitors are able to display imported bodies without robust evidence of consent. I would also like to briefly touch on a related question raised by the noble Lord, Lord Alton and others on the export of medicines and medical devices and concerns that they may ultimately be used for unethical purposes. In the context of UK export of medicines and devices, I must first emphasise the UK's critical role as a leading supplier of medicines, vaccines and other essential health commodities, which bring enormous benefit to low and middle income countries around the world. So any proposal to implement so any proposal to apply rigorous export controls to medicines and devices presents a significant risk of unintended consequences for the many individuals who receive often life-saving, safe and effective procedures supplied by UK companies. The risk is particularly per pertinent when considering the types of medicines and devices that could theoretically be used for the purposes of organ extraction, which could capture any device used in general surgery from syringes, sutures, scalpels, up to ventilators and bypass machines. For medicines, it would include anaesthetics, muscle relaxants and antibiotics. Such steps could unduly affect the export of a huge range of goods being used for legitimate and critical functions. Of course, it is absolutely right that we guard against the UK and UK companies from being complicit in human rights abuses. The government strongly backs the business and human rights agenda and has consistently supported the United Nations guiding principles on business and human rights as the authoritative voluntary international framework to steer practical action by governments and businesses worldwide. We are clear that we expect all our businesses to comply with all applicable laws identify and present, prevent human right abuse uh, risks and behave in line with the guiding principles. And, as demonstrated by the Foreign Secretary's announcement earlier today, we are prepared to go further where there is clear cause for concern that UK actors could inadvertently contribute to human rights abuses overseas. And I'd like to reassure the Noble Lord, Lord Collins, uh, that I will convey to the FCDO, uh, as part of that work, the concerns raised throughout the debate on this bill and the issues that we have discussed at all stages. So I'd like to again thank Noble Lords for their valuable and constructive engagement on these issues and trust that they will be reassured by the announcement made earlier today by the Foreign Secretary to help ensure that no British organisations are contributing inadvertently to human rights violations in Xinjiang. I welcome the amendment 13 tabled by the noble Lord, Lord Hunt, and I'm pleased to support it. So you've uh, no request to speak after the minutes have sat down, so I call on Lord Hunt of King's Heath to respond to the debate on his amendment. My Lords, this has been a short but incredibly important debate, and in addition to the noble Lords I've already thanked, I would pay tribute to Baroness Jolly and my noble friend Lord Collins for the sterling support they've given me throughout the passage of this bill. It's much appreciated. My Lords, I do stress this amendment is not the definitive response to the horrific abuse taking place uh, in China, and it is enabling legislation. And there is much to do, as Baroness Finley said, um, 
we need greater vigilance over exports and transplant tourism is another area of, of real concern. And both Baroness Northover and the noble Lord, Lord Alton, spoke about HTA and their rather um, relaxed approach to the Real Bodies exhibitions. I must say, I find it extremely embarrassing that one of these exhibitions did take place in Birmingham, but I am glad that um, the Commonwealth Games are coming to the city next year, and it's adopted a robust ethical policy, which I think if extended to the National Exhibition Centre in the future, would ensure that we wouldn't see these exhibitions again. No, Lord, Lord Alton, of course, has identified a number of other areas which the minister responded to today. And the noble Lord Ribeiro, uh, I think, spoke very forcibly about the role of the World Health Organization. Again, I'm very glad that the government and the FCO in particular are talking closely to the WHO about it. Um, Baroness Penn made some number of very important messages at the end. The revisal and toughening up of the HTA Code of Practice. She talked about licensing procedures and in relation to exports of medicines and devices. My lords, these are all welcome. We cannot, though, be complacent. As my noble friend, Lord Collins says, we cannot, as a country, show any tolerance towards these barbaric acts. This amendment is significant, particularly because it shows that the UK, and with the support of the government ministers, are taking it seriously, and I'm very, very grateful to all noble lords who have helped make this happen. My lords, I beg to move. I shall now put the question. The question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. As many as that opinion say content. Yeah. Contrary, not content. The contents have it. The Amendment 13 has been made.